Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kipun Kutemira. I will be the program director for the day. Before we proceed with today's webinar, I'll just like to go through the program just so that everyone else is familiar with the program. The program is also being projected on your screens as well. Um, when we start, we'll start off with the opening and welcoming from Mr. Silomalepa, the communications manager. We will then be followed by the purpose of the day, which will be highlighted by Mr. Tietzi Shupi, the acting um, head of department, legal services. After Mr. Shipping does the, <coughs> the purpose, we'll then proceed to the presentation that will be done by research. Um, the reports will then be highlighted by Mr. Khun Zetau. Um, after um, Mr. Khun Zetau speaks, we'll then have a session for Q&A, which will, will be um, 15 minutes. Um, once we're done with those questions, we'll then proceed with the speaker from the Public Information and Education Program, Ms. Kenfani Shekani. After Mr. After Mr. Um, Shekani, we'll then proceed with another session of Q&As. And then there'll be a presentation on the gender transformation reports in um, done by Ms. Matthews from the legal department. After Ms. Matthews, will then be a question and answer session as well. The way forward will then be done by Mr. Bradley Sonnenpool. After Mr. Bradley Sonnenpool, the program will then be closed by Mr. Ramos Ralefi. And then that will then conclude the, um, the session of today. Thank you. I'll then start off to just welcome Mr. Silomolegua to just do the opening and welcome. Thank you very much, Yukumuri. Uh, uh, good morning uh, to all the colleagues who are uh, right here in the boardroom uh, with us this morning as we open this uh, uh, webinar today. I would just like to recognize uh, uh, commissioners uh, who are joining us online. Uh, you are welcome. We acknowledge your presence in the webinar. We also acknowledge the presence of other uh, people who are who are just live now, who are in the Teams meeting, joining us online. We say welcome, and this is just going to be the opening uh, of our webinar, and your presence is uh, is duly noted. In the boardroom, uh, uh, where we are now at the CGE head office, we have the HOD for legal services, Mr. Tieti uh, Shubin, the head of department for the PI, uh, 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 department, Ms. Pilisiwe Gabela, and we have the uh, manager in the office of the CEO, Mr. Rabula Lezemo, and we have uh, colleagues from the legal department uh, at her office, uh, Bradley Notemba, uh, and the and we are also joined by uh, our acting deputy director for PDI, uh, My name is Lomolegua, I am the communications manager. And you are welcome uh, to this webinar. We are looking forward to the engagements, and we believe that we are going to participate. That there's going to be a fruitful engagement in the subject, and look forward to those who are also going to join us as we as we continue. Thank you very much for your attendance, and uh, uh, we can just with those few words say the session is over. Thank you very much in that in just those few words. Thank you, Mr. Mulegos, for the warm welcome. I will then proceed with Mr. Tiet Shipi to just highlight the purpose of today's webinar. Thank you. Um, good morning, um, our stakeholders, um, and also we can do to um, the listeners that are joining us online this as well. Um, my name is Tiet Shipi, and I was already introduced. I'm the team head of the legal department. Uh, I will be taking you through the people's of today. We just uh, presenting the time. Um, the, today's engagement is regarding the gender transformation reports um, on institutions of higher learning. 
that is the reports that we have been concluding during the period of 2014 to 2023. Just as the start, the Commission for Gender Equality is an independent statutory body established with Chapter 9 institutions under Section 21 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, 1996. Its mandate is provided for in Section 187 of the Constitution, as well as um, in the Commission for Gender Equality Act. The CG is mandated to promote respect and develop, attain gender equality, and to make recommendations. Section 1872 grants the CG in the power is regulated by national legislation in necessary to perform these functions including the powers to monitor, investigate, research, educate, advise, and make recommendations that it deems necessary. With this engagement of today, um, we will be taking you through the reports that we have compiled and, and during the period of 2014 to 2024. And in accordance with our mandate, we completed these particularly the focus was on institutions of higher learning, transformation, and gender issues uh, identified. The last of our reports, we released it uh, for the financial year 2024, which is titled The Fate of Gender Transformation in Education Institution. The aim of this engagement, uh, particularly, is to have the voices and input of stakeholders, students, lecturers, and staff on the observations that will be highlighted by the Commission, and as well as discussing the solutions to the slow progress of transformation at our institutions. We will touch, among others, the inclusivity and safety at the universities. So post this engagement, we will then take the input and uh, then um, uh, and engage the president in accordance with the Commission for Gender Equality Act, which is and 15 to address the, the, the issues that are highlighted. So, therefore, we are um, looking forward for a fruitful engagement and uh, for uh, discussions around solutions and issues that we are having. And um, yeah, we look forward to uh, your participation uh, online and as well as the colleagues that are with us here. Thank you. Um, what we'll take you through now is just to show you. Uh, in passing some of the reports that we are doing. Uh, this is our recent report, uh, the 2023-2024. Those uh, universities showed today are the universities that are cleared before the commission. Um, we can go to the next one. Also, we have uh, reports on TVET colleges. And the 2022-2023 report shows also the TVET colleges that appeared there. Also, the 2021-2022, we'll see that there are several um, colleges that appear before the commission. We will be taking you through the observations of the commission of, of these reports. So the next one also is another team, team colleges report, 2020-2021. The next one, uh, the, it's the tertiary institutions or universities that appeared before the commission around 2018 and 2020. This report are accessible in our website is indicated. We also have the 2017 and 2018 report as well. And for that 2015 and 2016, remember we indicated that we have been doing these reports to um, for over 10 years. And we have the 2014 and 15 reports um, where we started this investigation with the investor. South Africa and the University of Atlanta. All right, thank you. These are some of the reports that we'll be taking you And then we thank you for um, giving you. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Shipping, for familiarizing all of us with the purpose of today. The session will now start off with all the presenters. After the first presenter presents, there will be a 15-minute session where we will be conducting the questions and answer session. So I will now hand over to Mr. Khunzim um, Mutawu 
to proceed with the research um, presentation. Uh, thank you so much, colleagues. Uh, uh, just, just to check, am I audible from your side? Yes. Okay, thank you yes, so much. You Please pardon me, I'm not, I'm not feeling well. I woke up with a very terrible flu. So I might be interjecting there and there and my voice does not sound that well. Uh, I, if you would allow me to share my screen. Uh, I'm not sure if you're able to see that. Yes, we can see. Yes, we are. Yes. Um, thank you so much. My name is Khun Taung. I'm from the research department. I'm one of the researchers uh, under one of the strategic arms of the uh, Commission for Gender Equality, uh, which is the research uh, out of the three, which is PI and legal. And uh, as per the CGE mandate, the, our role in research is to investigate issues surrounding gender equality within the context of uh, South Africa. And just like to enhance the work of the commission, the CGE is equally in the year 2023-24 and for research units, so it fit that it should also conduct research within the space of higher education, just to enhance the work that is already done within the uh, institution. And one of the reports that we did in 2023, 2024, was a research report, which is a recent one, which is, is yet to also be launched, a research report on sexual harassment in higher education uh, institution. Um, as highlighted, our role as the research department uh, is to conduct research to, uh, and analyze social norms, behaviors, beliefs, and practices that undermine the attainment of gender equality in the country. And this is also as highlighted to fulfill the mandate of the CGE, which is to monitor and evaluate the policies and practices of organs of states, statutory bodies, functionaries, uh, public bodies, authorities, private sector, and civil society to promote gender equality uh, as per outcome three of uh, our APP. And the report is for ease because I've only given, because this is a lengthy report, but I was given 15 minutes just to take you through the report that we, we did, uh, but the report is accessible on the CGE website. Uh, uh, for your perusal, but I'm just going to give you a guide. Then we can have a question and answer uh, for clarity seeking questions. However, I, sh I should highlight that a full report on the report will be done uh, as it is done with other reports where stakeholders will be highlighted and will be taken through the report. So, in the 2023 financial year, the CEG conducted a study titled the Research Report on Sexual Harassment in Higher Education. Uh, and the report was guided by the growing scourge of gender-based violence in higher education, and also looking at the fact that there is, there has been a huge room or vacuum that has not been looked at in terms of higher, uh, uh, in terms of sexual harassment in higher education. And many times when you speak of sexual harassment in higher education, a lot of people would think of uh, sexual harassment uh, or, uh, in, in light of lecturers versus students uh, or workers versus workers. But in this case, we wanted to look at sexual harassment from a different lens, but also not overlooking the fact that it also uh, happens amongst lecturers and students and, uh, and, and, in other, and, and other stakeholders within the institution of higher learning. In this case, we also wanted to look at sexual harassment uh, across students and students, political leaders and uh, within students and all that, based on the scourge that is growing of uh, gender-based violence in, in higher education that has been reported in South African universities recently, uh, and, and then also that has been growing, because we understand that 
uh, it's, 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 it's a process. Sexual harassment is more like a process. It, 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 uh, GBV actually, it's a process. It, it, it does not only start as GBV, but it also it is enhanced uh, by a practice of sexual harassment and other, any, uh, many other things. Uh, that is what has led to or what we wanted to look at into sexual harassment. Uh, you would understand, I did prepare a presentation, but I just wanted to take you through the actual report, uh, just bits and pieces of that, then we can discuss it. This is a very close, uh, uh, the study is very close to my heart. Uh, uh, you'd, you'd see that in most cases I'd be speaking because I was the leader of the project. So I would be speaking on something that I actually have more understanding in. Uh, what led to the advocacy of the study was uh, the, the the problem that we've been seeing it's uh, uh, regarding uh, the, the the prevalence of sexual harassment that is being reported in higher education, uh, particularly amongst female students. And uh, yes, when we were looking at the study, uh, the study was not only based on female students, but the the the, the prevalence is mostly among female students. But the study was looking at sexual harassment uh, that is experienced by female students, sexual harassment that is experienced by the members of the LGBTQI+, and their sexual harassment that is also uh, uh, experienced by the male counterparts within the, the student bodies. And also looking at the contribution of uh, different stakeholders within the uh, university body, especially student bodies from political parties, student political parties, also looking at uh, the role of the SRCs into that and other uh, uh, stakeholders and policies that are put in place by institutions of higher learning to address issues of sexual harassment within the institution of higher learning. So the study, uh, in terms of uh, its, 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 its methodology, what we looked at, the study looked at three, okay, initially we wanted to look at about six institutions of higher learning uh, as, as the genesis of the study because we are looking into enhancing this as time goes on, but we wanted to look at six institutions of higher learning and uh, looking at both TVITs, public and private sectors, TVITs, uh, TVITs, uh, and your, your uh, uh, other, other forms of higher education that 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 actually uh, 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 participate within the higher education spectrum, uh, but due to challenges uh, during data collection, as you understand that many a times it is one of the challenges that the CGE finds itself in when it comes to uh, advocating for such issues is that there are a lot of challenges in terms of uh, uh, allowing access of the, uh, the commission to coming in and then conducting its data. And then this, uh, we ended up only conducting data in three institutions. However, I should highlight that the, we did saturate, uh, we did reach saturation in terms of what we're looking at based on the data that we got. So we ended up looking at three institutions in three provinces as the genesis of the study. We looked at North, uh, Nelson Mandela, uh, university in the West in, in the Eastern Cape province uh, in Trabeja. And then we also look at Sol Plaki University in the Northern Cape province. And we also looked at Northwest University, uh, specifically Mafeken campus in the uh, Northwest province. Why these three specific institutions is that many a times when we speak of sexual harassment and any studies and th that we want to conduct, we always look at uh, uh, institutions that are mostly written about you people would always look at vets uh UPs and, and and other things and there's a lot that has been written on that but it's uh we, we thought in this case let us look at those institutions that are not written on mostly uh just to see what is it if what we see because when we did our literature review uh there was a lot of data that we found on other institutions that have mentioned your UCTs and your vets but we wanted to see if the the this the, the prevalence varies around these or all, all all these institutions and what are systems that we have in these institutions that mostly are not spoken about and that has led to us sampling these three institutions and another reason for that is that we look at the geographical uh, spectrum of these institutions if you look at uh, some of them are slightly rural based 
and when you get the, for example, NMU, uh, the, 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 the nature of how it's, it's, it's it, the, how it's grounded, it's, it's slightly oil based, and then in, in terms of its structures and in, in terms of its uh, populace, and also with regards to SPU, we looked at, uh, yes, it's not that new, but uh, SPU as an organization, as an institution currently, is, is one of the new universities that you found in South Africa, and we wanted to check if this, if SPU or these new coming up institutions are actually starting up with proper policies to address such, or they're following on uh, the norm that they start up with uh, no policies and, and all of the things that usually happen. And then also Northwest University is looking at its nature and also uh, and how it's looked at and also looking at what they have. Firstly, what we did with the studies, we looked at what the institutions have and if it's similar in terms of structures that are there to address sexual harassment within the context. And it was quite interesting to find that these institutions have uh, different structures in place, although some seems to not be sufficient to address sexual harassment. Uh, what we did is in terms of the uh, how we collected our data, we separated uh, the data collection into two aspects. We did uh, focus groups and we also did one-on-one -on -one interviews. We did focus groups with institutional students uh, or students within that, which we separated into three groups. We had focus groups with females within the uh, uh, institutions of finally all three institutions. And we also had uh, focus groups with the male groups in all these three institutions. And when they also had focus groups of the members of the LGBTQI+. So all in all, in each institution, we had three uh, focus groups of about close to 20 uh, students uh, per, per focus groups, given the nature of how many were given to us during that time. And the response was vastly uh, acceptable from all the groups. So all in all, in terms of all these three institutions, we had nine focus groups uh, that gave us more than 100 students that participated within this. And also in terms of the then one on one interviews, we looked at the structures that existed within the universities. So we looked at the transformation offices, and under the transformation offices, we looked at what existed, which offices existed within the context of uh, addressing sexual harassment within that. So, in the case of uh, uh, S uh, SPU, for example, we found that they did not have much uh, in terms of that, only they have. They had the psychological department or the department the department that dealt with uh, the, a unit that deals with the psychological aspect and social counseling of students and around that. But they did not have specific specific uh, unit that deals with sexual harassment on that within that. And then also then they had the SRC. Then with NMU, they had of the transformation office that seemed to be vast in, in terms of uh, well aligned in terms of how it should address sexual harassment because the transformation unit had one, uh, a transformation a director within it, the transformation office director. And under that, they had a GBV, uh, a GBV officer. They had Singamatota officer uh, that, that deals with uh, toxic and positive masculinity within the institution. And then they also had a, 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 a pride office that deals with issues around LGBTQI+. And they had dedicated uh, a system that deals with sexual harassment apart from issues and cases of GBV. And then also when it comes to Northwest University, it also had a transformation office that is centralized within the institution, not the campus. However, they did not have a specific uh, office that dealt with sexual harassment within that, but also there are issues centered around GBV. And what was common within all of these institutions is that all of them had uh, security services, which is titled control, uh, security services within that, that seem to have uh, most of the sexual harassment cases reported to them. So we also had interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews with uh, uh, security personnel within the, those units. The findings that we found within all of these students are, are just based on because I have 15 minutes and I see I'm almost, my time is almost out. Uh, the findings that we found within this was that, uh, one, there were no policies around sexual harassment that spoke to sexual harassment in most of this. 
direct policies, clear policies that that spoke and addressed sexual harassment in higher policies. In two institutions, we found that the sexual harassment policy that guided everyone was uh, mostly in line, inclined towards employees, not students, from students to students and others. And it was only in NMU that they had a direct sexual po uh, harassment policy that spoke into it. However, it was not clear uh, and it was not uh, clear on who it addresses. For example, it was not gender sensitive on the basis that it did not, it was not quite clear uh, on issues around members of the LGBTQI+, whereas they are one of the most vulnerable groups that experiences sexual harassment within the, the, the context of higher education. Uh, and, the presentation is not moving. Uh, I don't know if you are aware. Sorry, we can't see what you're talking about. Uh, let me just check. <clears throat> Please pardon me, I'm just checking because I thought it's moving from that side. Uh, is it still sharing? What are you seeing on your side? We are just seeing page five that talks about Winenem Khojan. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you so much for that. I thought it was actually moving. Uh, You're welcome. Just going to take you know, just a phone call, say just a couple of minutes to just be able to sort out the technology glitch in terms of his presentation. We'll just afford you two minutes to just um, gather your presentation. Are you able to see this presentation now? Yes, yes we can. Thank you. Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, 
Yes, thank you. As I was highlighting some of the some of the as I was highlighting some of the the findings that we found in 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 in, in terms of these, uh, I'm just wrapping up. Uh, the findings that we found that apart from the policies that were not clearly defined and that we also learned that there were no clear defined structures that dealt with uh, sexual harassment and also the the level of the reporting was quite low uh, in other instances you find that you you hope that the level of reporting being low would speak to positivity of the situations being dealt with but during our interviews with the students we've learned that actually students did not even know about the existence of some of these structures and then their proximity to them was quite far in terms of the structures existing. And there was uh, an issue around the, the cases being dealt with and cases being known. There was a lot of issues across all three institutions that the uh, students felt there are no cases that have been dealt with. Some cases that have been dealt with, perpetrators are still roaming around the universities and then nothing is done. Uh, and some are subjected to even while an investigation is rolling out, some are being subjected to to attending same classes and all while an investigation is rolling out, are subjected to attending same classes with the victims uh, uh, because an investigation is not uh, concluded. So there are not cases and there's nothing uh, that it, uh, is done that, that speaks to addressing such issues of uh, students and, and, and all that within the in, uh, institutions of higher learning. So in terms of the conclusion, that is the synopsis of what we had found along what we were looking at. In terms of the conclusions, like I said, the report will be fully launched and then stakeholders will be invited in and taken through the, the, the thorough findings of, of this. So uh, what we, what the CGE concluded on was that there is still much that needs to be done within the state uh, the state of higher education in addressing sexual harassment uh, uh, universities have a responsibility to ensure that they meet their minimum obligations to provide a safe place for all especially for students so there's need there is a vast need to rework policies within context of higher education there is so much that needs to be done and then also it was recommended that Institution of higher learning. Uh, sorry, I'm just rushing because I'm being I'm just being reminded of time. Institution of higher learning, uh, private and public should also follow national and policies guidelines as well as those developed and published by higher higher health. Uh, this is something that we found that most institutions are looking at higher health, but they are not fully following the guidelines of higher health. So they should look at them. They should also speak to uh, having and complicated pragmatic and policies that must be developed and structured, put in place at all higher educations, including technical and vocational education and training TVs, colleges and communities uh, and CET centers to address sexual harassment. And it is also crucial to ensure that this dissemination awareness and education regarding all available and applicable frameworks, policies, procedures, support and responsive structures. And also, there needs to be an improvement in collaborations among formal uh, on-campus support structures and response structures to ensure adequate investigation in the form of responses avenues and representations uh, as essential. These were part of the, 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 the recommendations that were actually agreed and came about by the study. And I should apologize. Uh, for 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 the not good so projection of the study as i've highlighted we will have a a, a, a report launch where we'll take stakeholders through this in in thorough uh thorough presentation on the findings of the study thank you so much um, thank you very much um mr Huntington, for the presentation um, I think everyone is aware that we're just running a bit delayed on time due to the technical glitch as well. So I will now proceed to um, the um, questions and answers session. We'll open it up for 10 minutes just to save on time. So I'll start off with the members in the boardroom to find out if there's any questions in the boardroom.
there's no questions in the boardroom, so I'll move over to everyone who's online, all the delegates online, to find out if there's any questions on that side. Portia, you, you may proceed with your question. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thanks for the presentation of this study. Uh, it is meaningful and it needs uh, informed interventions for things to be done. And my question that I have to the presenter is around the issue of the research methodology. When he was or they were talking about uh, the research methodology, uh, they reported that the study was done in northern, if I'm not mistaken, Western Cape and also in Northwest, and they, they, they have reached a data saturation. However, I'm willing that an expansion or an exploration of this study could go to other provinces, because now the two provinces above is under, the, the two uh, institutions above, they are falling under one uh, uh, province, of which what is happening in Northwest and what is happening in Cape Town and what is happening in Gauteng and Limpopo, it might not be the same. So thank you. That is what I wished to say. Okay, thank you very much, Osha. I'll then now move to Lizelle. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for that um, presentation. It was it was very interesting. Um, I um, was very gratified to hear what, what you said about um, how important policy is in terms of sexual harassment being reported and how the policy is currently falling short and how um, people should follow the policy and guidelines from higher health. And I'd just like to mention that um, in the um, recent four protocols from higher health on um on you know following the the mandate from the national strategic plan on gbv mm. that they that they mm. excluded um mention of the lgbtiq plus community yes. that the guidelines that that the policy guidelines coming from the department of higher education and training seem to have excluded lgbt mention of lgbti community when issuing guidelines on new policies for tertiary um, institutions and that even the protocols from higher health exclude lgbti and these these guidelines coming from dhet and higher health came from the national strategic plan on gbv which mentions lgbtiq plus community throughout and yet somehow in going from the national strategic plan on gbv to the department of higher health and to high, higher um to the department of higher education and training systemic homophobia seems to have seen the removal of the LGBTIQ plus community mentioned specifically. If a group of people, whether it's sexual harassment or women or, or anything is excluded from the policies, then um, it becomes very difficult to report on these things, as the speaker said, because it does it becomes very unclear whether um, these things are important in terms of reporting. So I just wanted to raise that issue. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, please advise if I should. I'm not sure if the silence mean, means I should respond or. Um, Jay, you may proceed with your question. Just before you proceed, Jay, I just want to remind you everyone that you've got five minutes left to pose your questions and statements. Jay, you may proceed. Mm, thank you so much uh, for accepting me. I hope I'm audible. Um, this is more of a comment rather than a question. I'm quite um, impressed actually with the presentation that has just uh, been um, presented, especially specifically including of the LGBTI um, group, because a lot of times when you talk about like um, gender, um, 
gender information is really done binary and the LGBTI people are often ignored. So that it's a it, it's a salute, but I'm quite more interested in looking forward to actually seeing the specific exactly what the LGBTI people people had to post because we're sitting on a lot of cases of specifically, especially a lot of uh, lesbian identifying women who are targeted specifically to be, um, you know, to be changed, so to speak, in inverted commas. So the LGBTIQ plus community is extremely vulnerable over and above just uh, people either identifying as being men or women. So I like to like just um, give a salute to that and hopefully tighten tighten all the tighten the inclusion of policies because when people get um, harassed, anything from hate speech all the way to physical crimes, for them to go and report on the premises, they experience even further victimization because people they have to report to are homophobic or biphobic or transphobic. So we need to con constantly highlight and include those groups of people. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Jay. I'll now proceed to Koreba. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. You made a mention of private institutions, yet I saw that you could only obtain information from public institutions. And I know myself doing my doctorate on GBV and private higher education institutions in South Africa, that the picture looks very different in private higher education institutions as there isn't currently a GBV policies that's currently being uh, enforced at these institutions. Did you come across any information on private higher education institutions? Um, I'll afford Ms. Dumdum to just give a brief answer to Garika's question. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. These are quite good. Uh, Presentations just to give clarity uh, to, to Portia. Uh, the study looked at three provinces: Northern Cape, Eastern Cape, and and the East, Eastern Cape and the Northwest Province. Uh, looking at three: SPU, Northwest University, and uh, and NMU. However, as I've alluded, we we are looking into expanding the study because they wish. Uh, is to to expand this because of there are a lot of institutions of higher learning and they depict a different picture. And you are correct when you say what is experienced in uh, province one is not what is quietly experienced uh, given the, 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 the differences. So we are definitely looking into expanding the study in the future to look at that. And uh, yes, Lisa, this is also something that we found uh, that higher health uh, and also, it, it was one of the findings that even in other institutions that follow guidelines of higher health, did I, I allude that uh, the, the reason much of the policy is not guided that is because of even higher health does not have much on issues around the issues uh, around uh, members of the LGBTQI plus. So, which is also a founding that we've highlighted and also a recommendation that that needs to be looked at holistically. Um, on the 16th, we are presenting the same study. Uh, uh, 16th of this month, uh, next week, we are presenting the same study at the de uh, Department of Higher Education and Learning, uh, where we would be uh, taking some of these issues and then some of these findings that were found there at, at that platform to address some of these things. And yes, Jay, quite correct. And this is one of the things that we saw when we were going in then, and we were very intentional when we were doing this study that uh, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to find ourselves brushing through the issues because the issues vary. And you will see even in the study, the findings were quite vast and direct. And some of the issues that you are finding, we find dire things around issues of members that are affecting members around the, the issues of LGBTQI plus. And that's why we are very intentional with having conversations with members of the LGBTQI plus on the issues that are directly affecting them. I should highlight uh, for sensitivity issues, we were not looking at, we we're not interviewing victims, but we were looking at students or uh, uh, people who are, are affiliated within such groups. We spoke with students who are within that, and they spoke freely on issues uh, around uh, around the the, the, the the issues. And then uh, the, the the last speaker, yes, uh, you are correct. We. Our wish was to look at all the sectors, and hence we took a decision that you know what, there was no way we could do justice in the study if we 
we, we did a study that, 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 that looked at them holistically because the issues that are within the private sector and public are very vast and are different. Uh, if you look at in our method, uh, literature review, we've covered and uh, we've given a background uh, that will be our uh, backdrop when we continue with the study looking strictly and directly on Tivitz College. Uh, we gave a backdrop of what is found there and I can guarantee you uh, the, 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 the picture is very dark uh, and, and it, it does not even need to, it does not even require a comparative study between private and public. It, it's a study on its own. That's why we decided that when you look at, when we enhance, we also need to, to give special focus on this. But in our literature review, we did have, we have a section where we're looking at this, giving a background as our backdrop looking forward to taking up the studies and what we found there. And I can guarantee you that we did find that there are decisions that to this day, just like in public, that do not have any policies that are existing in, ten, in terms of uh, addressing sexual harassment. Uh, some do not even have other structures. Uh, even in, in when we're looking at in some of the interviews, uh, what was interesting is that even uh, units, for example, security units that are entrusted with a, a, a dealing with this said to us in that uh, we don't even know what we are, we are doing. Can you come and assist us? We don't even know what we are doing. That's how dire the situation is. So definitely when we extend and expand on the study, we are looking into looking at the private sector on its own because the picture uh, it might not, it, we might not do justice if we combine the studies and looking at the fact that the issues surrounded, they, they are not the same. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um... I'll now proceed to Paulette Naidu. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you to the presenter for this comprehensive presentation. Um, it's a, a comment and a question. Um, I think your research basically confirms and backs up what I think we all observe and experience experience and witness um, in higher education in terms of GBV and sexual harassment prevalence. My, my question is around the fact that the problem is persisting, even though we have known for a long time that GBV is existing. So um, in terms of, uh, even if you develop policies, uh, the actual implementation of those policies um, I think are problematic. And my follow-up question then is, who holds institutions accountable for their response or lack of response to GBV? Because in theory, we can all acknowledge that there's a problem, but different institutions um, are displaying different responses, and this is reflected in their resource allocation, the fact that there's dedicated units and staff. Um, and so those that are actually not complying, for want of a better word, who holds them accountable? Because if nothing is happening, we're going to see a perpetuation of GBV and sexual harassment and underreporting of cases because people will lose faith in the system and only see it as just uh, lip service. So I think this is important to come across and how it actually gets tackled and who is held accountable for supporting us and dealing with this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paulette. The last hand we'll be taking is from Irene. And we note that there are comments or chats on the on the group, but we'll proceed with them at a later stage. Irene, please pose your question or statement. Thank you. Firstly, let me welcome the report and opportunity to participate in this session. I want to request that um, CGE consider uh, presenting these reports in universities. And coming from Walter Sisulu University, University, I'm looking forward to really hosting you so that this report can be shared with all the stakeholders who were unable to attend this session. Secondly, I fully agree that um, it is prudent 
that the very same study be replicated in other universities because we really need this data so that we are able to implement evidence-based interventions. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. We'll now proceed to the next speaker um, from the Public Information and Education Unit, Ms. Fanny Shekan, to proceed with their presentation. Uh, good morning. May I please uh, project my presentation before I introduce myself? And I would also like to check if my presentation is, is, is visible from your side. Yes. Yes, it is. Oh, oh okay. Thank you so much. Um, good morning once more. Yeah, it's still in the morning. My name is Kensani Legani. I will be presenting on behalf of PEI department. Uh, I'm an education officer attached to Limpopo province. Uh, my presentation is going to give you some highlights on the work carried out or done by PEI in institutions of higher learning. Um, my presentation is not going to only reflect on the work done in 2023 and 2024 only, but I will take it from uh, financial year 2022, 2023-2022. 3 2024 and 2024 up to current. Reason being that uh, PEI work is continuous, so we continue to do interventions in institutions of higher learning. Um, okay. So my, my, my presentation will highlight um, the PEI strategic role and the purpose of this unit within the CGE. And also uh, I'm going to look at the strategic approach, the approach that we employ as public education in order to ensure that gender transformation is achieved in institutions of higher learning. Uh, my presentation is also going to reflect uh, different provinces. The reason why we divided our presentation or we segmented our presentation into different uh, provinces is because we want people to have an idea which institutions in particular were engaged and where exactly the, inter, uh, the interventions happened. Uh, because uh, sometimes we, we we, if we, 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 we take it broadly uh, and, and nationally, we won't be able to locate actually where the work has happened. Uh, so in my, in my slide, you can be able to see only seven provinces that are highlighted there. I don't have information from the other two provinces. That does not mean that work was not done or we're not going to present their work today. However, I must also maybe uh, make a disclaimer that my presentation, it's not going to include everything and it's not going to be uh, to give every detail of the work done by PEI because of the limitation of the limited time that is allocated to us. Not sure. Oh, it's, it's, it's not sure. It's not sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the, the PEI or the Public Education and Information uh, Section or pub, uh, Department, it's found within the strategic objective, uh, the strategic outcome number two of the annual uh, performance plan. Our purpose is to develop and to manage information and education programs to foster public understanding of gender equality and the role of the commission. We, 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 we conduct information programs 
education programs to, if, to foster public understanding uh, on issues pertaining the promotion of gender equality and the role and the activities of the commission. Our, um, our strategic role is to ensure that um, the, the, the it is to ensure that the education uh, 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 the education for the commission for gender equality is targeted to the public and also to conduct advocacy initiatives and to develop and to manage public education interventions with sector partners in promotion of public understanding of gender and gender equality and access to gender justice I'm not going to dwell much on the on the on the on this slide because of time. However, I'll just highlight that this uh, this slide simply shows how our strategic objective or strategic object objective number two that we are responsible of. It, it simply shows how it is uh, divided into outcomes and how it is translated into out, uh, output indicators and 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 activities. Um, let me take you through the the work or the, the 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 strategic approach that we employ as PEI to ensure that uh, gender transformation is achieved in institutions of higher learning. As a department, we promote and monitor gender mainstreaming interactions through a sector-based approach using key role players in public, private, and civil society sector. So, uh, institutions of higher learning. Uh, are included in 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 in, in this uh, in this regard we provide higher learning institutions with critical information about gender equality in the form of advocating for transformation policies frameworks and training of trainer initiatives uh, we call it gender and um, development which influence the number of people and organizations who can represent and promote gender equality our advocacy approach liaises closely with various critical stakeholders in higher learning to assess the gendered nature of policy compliance on matters concerning transformation, inclusion, diversity, and equity. The department uses various approaches to disseminate public education and information programs with the aim of reaching various segments of higher learning communities. So as I've indicated at the beginning of my presentation, I'm going to give you highlights from, from different provinces. Uh, the provinces are not in particular order. So yeah, it, they, they are not in particular order, but I will start with Eastern Cape. In the Eastern Cape, the city in the Eastern Cape has conducted radio interviews on various topics with radio stations, particularly with Mtata. Uh, UCR, I think UCR stands for uh, UNITRA Community Radio Stations in Walter Sulu University. Also in, in the Eastern Cape, CGE took part in a session that reviewed Walter Sulu University policies. This current financial year 2024-2025, the CGE in the Eastern Cape is working with two colleges, East Cape Midlands, and equality at colleges on gender mainstreaming. Uh, they are also partnering with the University of Fort Hare, planning for a seminar on gender-based violence and femicide uh, that will involve 26 universities in the country that is going to take um, part in the seminar. The seminar will be held in November 2024. The next province that I'm going to highlight is Free State Province. The Free State Province has, uh, has thus far been engaging and collaborating with the Central University of Technology through information dissemination on gender-based violence, sexual harassment, rights of unmarried fathers during health week interventions through exhibitions, dialogues, and radio education. They also interact and collaborate with uh, Central University of Technology and University of Free State in various forums such as the Victim Empowerment Forum and the Trafficking in Persons Forum, wherein the CGE is responsible for providing an oversight and an oversight role and relevant data on the latest research. 
The CG has furthermore been invited by various institutions to provide presentations on various thematic areas that are gender related. The next province will be Houteng province. Uh, we will all know that uh, Houteng province is the one which hosts the most, the highest number of, of, of institutions of higher learning. So there they are displayed, but I'm not going to go through each and every one of them because of time. Um, so the next slide will highlight how dense key focus areas in institutions of higher learning. They have focused on gender representation in leadership, where percentage of women and men in senior management and leadership positions were, 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 were reviewed. They also focused on student in enrollment by gender. They also focused on staff representation by gender, uh, scholarships and financial aid allocation by gender. And they also looked at career develop, uh, career advancement opportunities and access to facilities. The current interventions or the work that is being done currently by, by the Houting office, they are promoting gender equality and disseminating information education programs. They are also uh, influencing on gender policies through advocacy and educational outreach. They are also engaged in, the, in gender development programs. They are also engaged in student support office and student representative council educational programs. They also engaged in appoint, they were also appointed in, as an advisory board to the university's transformation office. They looked into that actually. They also played a, a pivotal role in internal and external gender transformation strategies and on employment equity. Uh, also looked at impact on management and students. And their ongoing uh, efforts include continuous and, and monitor they continue to monitor and promote gender equality in higher education. And they use outreach programs like radio campaigns, SMS strategies, and other uh, awareness campaigns, outreaches in, within communities in universities. They also focus on policy development, gender transformation practices, and LGBTI rights protection. Their future focus, CG will, con will continue to build strategic relationships with universities and colleges to ensure lasting gender transformation in higher learning institutions. Uh, the next province will be Limpopo province. Limpopo province in the financial year 2022-2023, they had a stakeholder engagement with Limpopo TVET colleges and, and, and higher health where the focus was just to share the mandate of the commission and to understand, to get to understand the role of student support or triple as student support services in, within the TVET college, which is in promoting gender equality. We also uh, were very instrumental in, 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 in engaging the University of Limpopo during their early stage of establishing their gender desk. We contributed to the drafting of gender the strategy of the university. We also conducted two workshop sessions uh, targeting different departments within the university. The first uh, uh, workshop was targeting gender desk, wellness, human resource, student affairs, and also marketing department. The second one, we were targeting the executive of the university where senior management were, were taken through gender and development. Uh, that included the vice chancellor of the of the university and every head of department. We also conducted two public uh, outreaches with with the investor of Limpopo marketing department targeting Vembe district and Capricorn district, and the continuous partnership and collaboration continues as we speak. Then we also have had engagements, or we still having engagements with the University of Venda, where we had a meeting to discuss gender transformation within the university. And through our collaboration with the university and the recommendations from the from the CGE, the University of Venda uh, formulated, or they 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 they. they, they established a working group that is now currently working on the establishment of a gender desk within the university. 
last year we had a stakeholder engagement with a post school and education and training sector where we were looking into uh, where we were looking into the, the 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 elimination of sexual harassment within the higher education and promoting of current frameworks such as the the the, the, the current good code of good practice on, on harassment and bullying and we're also looking into how you, uh, uh, institutions of higher learning can uh, customize and 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 localize nsp within their their environments in order to deal with issues of gender-based violence. We also looked at the role of accounting officers in addressing sexual harassment, grievances, and the role of Department of Higher Education and Training in supporting colleges to eradicate sexual harassment. Then, um, so yeah, the, the, this current financial year, we're looking into a, a sector approach where we are continuing with uh, with higher education sector. We had, we had our, our our meeting currently in September, where the audit tool was well, was administered, and there's continuous collaboration in 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 all institutions of higher learning. The next one is Northern Cape. The Northern in the Northern Cape office, uh, they engage both Solplaki University and the Northern Cape Tibet Colleges prior and post their appearance before the commission. The first year's annual inductions. The CGE was invited. Uh, oh, they, they 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 get invitations annually to come and make presentations and sensitize students on on on, on gender based violence annually during uh, 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 inductions in, in in January. In preparation for the hearings, the CGE also engaged the students and SRC on the intended hearings and post hearings regarding improvement on the campus safety. The, the, the CGE in the Northern Cape also arranged and was part of stakeholder engagement and seminars addressing the issues affecting students who are still on the Northern Cape. They also um, input, they also made input to Seoul Plaque University internal policies uh, by the Northern Cape office through MOUs and, colla and other collaborations. The CGE also investigated individual complaints received with uh, institutions of higher learning to address gender-based violence. They also have opened a channel of uh, uh, complaints referrals with Rose Technical uh, College. The next one is Northwest University. I think my time is almost up. The Northwest University has collaborated with Northwest, Northwest University. They've held stakeholder engagements and meetings in 2023, 2020, in 2022-2023. 20, they also organized the gender and development and awareness session for third year students. They also they were also engaged in men for real where they've collaborated with men's forum from the University of Northwest Mafiken campus. Uh, they also worked with TVET colleges around the province where they conducted investigative hearings with Tietso, with Tietso TVET college. And they also conducted gender and development workshops uh, targeting different students, target, targeting different departments. And then again, they also conducted uh, GAD workshops targeting SRC and peer education, peer educators within the with, within the, the, the three colleges, which is Tailenso, Obit, and Vuselela. They also conducted public outreach in partnership with three colleges. Uh, lastly, I will highlight work conducted or work uh, done in the Western Cape. They had gender transformation dialogue in Cape Peninsula University of Technology, where there was transformation lecture web webinar under the theme Understanding Transformation Dynamics Facing the Higher Education Landscape in South Africa. The objective uh, was to discuss gender transformation challenges within the institutions of higher learning in the country. The next, the next uh, point will be the were involved in research in Daba on gender-based violence in higher education. 
the, under the theme crafting trends patterns and awareness intervention to combat interventions to combat gender-based violence. The objectives was to share lessons, strategies, interventions, practices, and research agendas on holistic, integrated, multi-sectoral coordination and collaboration on gender equality and women empowerment to combat DBV in higher education. Um, I think this is my last my last slide. Still on the Western Cape. They, they had an invitation from Cape Peninsula Investor of Technology where they had cru crucial conversations under the theme voices and spaces, creating inclusive space recognition of voices, where the provincial manager in the, in the, in the Western Cape had to go and share insight on systematic inequalities in South Africa in higher education institutions. Um, currently, they have reached to an, uh, three institutions of higher learning that include Nelson Mandela University, South Cape Tivet College, Cape Town College. And the objective is to increase and to broaden the reach in gender transformation in which CGM is targeting the sectors in public and private sector to achieve gender equality. Um, Western Cape has an opportunity to also highlight uh, the, 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 the positive uh, uh, responses or the positive uh, observations and the negative observations from, from, from their province. The positive highlights include positive communication and cooperation in some institutions, and they indicated that some institutions are willing to work with CGE in making sure that there's recognition of gender equality, there's also they also indicated that the identif the identifying or dedicating official members to communicate with CGM where you, you the, the university will allocate a person as, as a contact person for CGE to work with that particular person. Uh, they also attending and participating and in an arranged meeting. It's well received. Oh, the attending and participating of meeting is well received by those institutions. Uh, the negative highlights highlighted shows that there's non-establishment of gender desk in some institutions. There's no programs in place for gender equality through gender transformation. There's poor understanding on the CGE mandate. Non-prioritization of CGE requirements regarding this approach. Management. There's negative perception regarding gender transformation. Thank you. At, yeah, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ken um, Anishagani, for that insightful presentation. The session will now open. The, the session will now be open to a second round of questions and answers. I will first start off with the members in the boardroom. Are there any questions or comments? I think I'll then proceed to the members online just to find out if there are any questions or comments from all the delegates online. I will then start off with um, Kaya. You may start off with your question. Apologies, Chair. I think I pressed the wrong uh, button. Okay, I'll then move over to Lazar with your question. Um, many thanks for that presentation. Um, a brief question, just in terms of, of addressing gender diversity in, in all of these areas and, and, and through all of this work that has been done, um, to, to what extent have, um, is, are the, um, is the LGBTI community considered in terms of um, addressing gender diversity or gender equality rather, sorry, um, because gender equality is not just on the binary of masculine and feminine, gender equality is about the inclusion of, of all genders. 
um, and um, the transgender and non-binary community as well. And in the in the assessment of job allocations and gender equality and scholarships and money allocation in terms of gender equality, just where it has anything is is gender diversity considered in all of these this gender equality or um are most of the programs run doing um awareness of gender equality on the binary thank you very much i'll now move over to portia Um, sorry about that thank you so much i'm saying i i was saying i'm not sure if um the presentation the last presentation the latter the interventions done in institutions we're talking to the gaps that were mentioned in the first in the findings of the study to bridge the gap because if not i'm sensing a lot of discrepancies for an example uh, the, the, present, the, the, the findings of the study was telling us that um, there is low level of reports, whilst the last presentation was telling us that there was advocacy work that was done. If advocacy work was done in other institutions, where is the number of people who were reporting uh, in terms of sexual harassment in the institutions if there was advocacy work or if maybe there was advocacy work what advocacy work were done yes it's true activities are done we are very happy about that and we upload but for me those are just outputs if you create awareness what are the outcomes how many people came therefore to report these cases and how many were attended how many cases were opened we can't just waste time and resources in ensuring to it that activities are done whilst people are it is reported that students are sitting in the same class waiting for the investigation to unfold i'm not i'm, I'm also worried to say if that is actually happening what is it that is happening to the survivor at that to, 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 to the to the to the to the survivor at that point in time because really that is a traumatic incident somebody has raped you investigations are done awareness has been created advocacy has been created but you are just seated with that so my take is that when these uh, activities are done let us not do them for the sake of doing them let us not do them for the sake of numbers to say we've reached in a dialogue we've reached in creating awareness we've reached we've reached let people be engaged as individuals to learn let us open up a space to hear individuals on what is it that they are saying because some of the people will never raise their hands say i was raped i was sexually harassed i was i was but if we create a platform whereby they would come out so that when we speak advocacy work we speak on how many people we have assisted i think that again it's a problem that is coming everywhere even in the seminars gpvf seminar whereby people they don't understand the mandate of the cge if you create awareness that is good how many have you found that are sexually harassed what is it that you have done in that regard i wish in future we can be able to know of that yes these dialogues are sitting but the structures are not known low level of what so everything and anything that was what well, that are the findings of this study and what the latter presentation has said both of them within the same organization that is cge are not coming together so thank you so much thank you very much Portia. um if there aren't any further questions dr shorzy will be the last hand that we'll be taking so that we can afford the public and information department to respond okay thank you very much are you are you giving the platform panels of the shorzy yes dr shorzy you may proceed Thank, thank you very much. We, I, I come from a university called Mangoso University of Technology, and I can see some uh, colleagues from the same university. Let's appreciate um, the report presented to to the universities, and I think it's 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 important that we we understand what happens within the corridors of the Commission for Gender Equality. I think we must salute you on that. And I must also say that um, 
thank you very much for presenting, more especially the public education report, because in most cases, institutions and the public, they tend to be more interested on investigative reports. But I'm saying public education is the way to go. We need to actually change the mindset of people around all these particular issues. And I think there needs to be a lot of investment on public education. And um, and uh, I think universities themselves, uh, we need to actually take these reports and go back and begin the process of engaging on whether can't we have ombud um, uh, programs within our university so to assist the commission when they do their work, they can easily interact with uh, our own internal uh, institutions. Um, I have just a few questions for you. One is, um, I also, I also uh, take the, the report on, 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 on sexual harassment in other universities. And also, and KZN was not there, and I hope that in the next report, it uh, will be represented as KZN, so can, you can see what are the issues uh, around uh, KZN in all the universities and, and TV colleges that we have here, which are also so many. And, and also gender-based violence and other gender equality issues that, 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 that we have. The first question is, when you look at gender-based violence and femicide and violence in general is shifting. Um, from 1998, we talk about the issues of domestic violence, killing of um, uh, people who were practicing, uh, alleged to be practicing witchcraft. There was some time when we, around the early, late 2000s, we were speaking of issues of sexual harassment, uh, sex for jobs, uh, Marx, sex for Marx. Are those things still happening at universities? Uh, the issues of homophobia, homophobia, I think, was raised as well. So taking all these co combinations, how to deal with the issues of, of violence. And now what we're also seeing simmering, surfacing, is not only all these other issues, it's violence against women, where people just come in the house and, 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 and shoot 17 or 18 people. How is the university going to, to, uh, to, 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 to deal with this? Are you considering having a policy of some point or a, or a law that is going to actually assist us to deal with gender-based violence uh, at tertiary institutions, take into consideration that uh, universities are macrocosm of what is actually happening in, in, in society. And these learners, they come from uh, particular communities as well. Um, and also issues, the interlinkages between gender equality, uh, homophobia, and, and also hate against uh, foreign uh, 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 nationals or internationals. Thank you very much. And I, I really, really appreciate this. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a step in the right direction. Uh, thank you very much, Program Director. Much appreciated. Thank you very much, Dr. Shindu, for all those questions. The last hand will now be that of Bosisive. Then I'll hand over to the PI department to provide their responses. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. My question is just around the issue of a comprehensive uh, program that maybe the speaker might have come across in these universities or might suggest the universities to develop. Is there any maybe idea that you can share here um, based on the education program that universities can develop to prevent a G GBV or women oppression or anything related to gender inequality? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Salma. i hand over to Ms. Niku from the EI Department. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Colleagues, my name is Kope Siku, and I will focus on the, um, the gender diversity that we need to consider uh, as we do our transformation work in the Commission for Gender Equality. So I just want to highlight that in the Commission for Gender Equality, um, really, we want to see inclusion of everyone. So now, um, when working with higher learning institutions, the CGE really um, lobbies and approaches the highest accounting offices, you know, in higher learning institutions. This is where we want to see a gender transformation being positioned. We want to see gender transformation being positioned in the highest office, like the vice chancellor's, uh, the management echelon of higher learning institutions. 
Why are we saying this? Because um, the placement of a uh, transformation, you know, in the highest accounting office, it is where we know that everyone is prioritized including this uh, marginalized group, such as the LGBTI community. Uh, their inclusion is very important. And we, yes, we want to see the LGBTI community being in the highest level of institutional governance. And this approach can help embed transformation into strategic planning and decision-making processes. Uh, in addition, you during this presentation, you have, you've learned that uh, provinces present different dynamics when it comes to the LGBTI uh, issues or the politics of gender diversity and inclusion. So we, 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 we require also tailored interventions based on this dynamics, you know. So now the public education works closely with uh, research and the legal department within the commission to have um, realistic and also evidence-based strategies why? Because we are a monitoring board. We want to monitor a policy compliance across the institution, ensuring that we address those unique challenges and promote more inclusive, supportive environment for um, a joint gender non-conforming students. I also want to expatiate on this, that we've also learned along the years the challenges in practice. So we are learning that there is invisibility of the LGBTI issues. Many as students who are gender non-conforming report feelings of invisible and higher education spaces as their specific needs and challenges are not explicitly addressed in campus culture or curricula. Hostile campus environment, despite anti-discrimination policies that uh, universities or higher learning institutions endorse, many campuses remain unsafe uh, for many students remain unsafe for, I mean, campuses remain unsafe for uh, students due to homophobia, transphobia, and hate crimes. Some institution may even fail to adequately protect these students from bullying or violence. Why? It's because of the mind, sh the, the, the mind shift. There is not, there is no uh, enough education, you know, that is in merit that, we, that a university needs to uh, adopt so that uh, people who present to be different are accommodated and respected and appreciated in such spaces. Also, we said it, that there is also a lack of awareness. So we need to understand that even both students and staff often lack awareness about the LGBTI rights and inclusivity, resulting in uh, much, uh, what we call, we call it micro uh, aggressions, exclusion, and misgendering, particularly for gender and non-binary students. So now our efforts, right, uh, holistically speaking at a high level, student support services are very important because this is where uh, we, we can influence the mind shift. This is where we can influence policy reviews. This is where we can also influence advocacy measures because we know that uh, while some universities have begun offering a uh, specific student support for gender non-conforming uh, persons, we know that of the Bits Matters Rant, uh, I will mention that because we have Gala, where, uh, and also other universities in other provinces, you know, they play a pivotal role in making sure that student support services directly on the LGBTI community, it is felt, it is understood through mechanisms, through methodologies, through also services such as counseling. And also, we also learn that there are um, um, students who also fall within this group, but because they are gay, lesbian, transgender, intersex, they still have their unique challenges. So this is where student support services should also understand and go deep and become deliber deliberate in access to resources and uneven uh, 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 challenges that they may have. Another thing uh, is gender neutral facilities. You will know that South Africa, South Africa is a global player and we borrow uh, interventions from our international uh, platforms. However, also, we need to auto-domesticate this and look more into how can we really make gender-neutral facilities work for us. Yes, I know, normally the debates are around the bathrooms, you know, the restrooms. And we also know that South Africa, it is a capital uh, country of rape, GBVF, and the like. So with this one, we need to understand that Although we're advocating for gender neutral facilities, you know, we also need to think of this uh, challenges where we know that there are a lot of gender defilements 
aimed at the LGBTIQI, uh, uh, sorry, at the uh, gender non-confirming individuals or, or, or individuals who are transgender or non-binary. And then lastly, curriculum integration. It is important that uh, uh, we understand that there is a growing demand right, in the inclusivity of the curricula across different fields of study. However, the integration of the LGBTIQA plus perspective institution remains limited, often relegated to niche electives rather than mainstream courses. I will end there. Thank you very much for being director. Thank you very much, Koki. And then I'll afford uh, Mr. Alitimo five last minutes to just present <laughs> on the responses. Okay. Um... Good, uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, colleagues. I don't think I will actually uh, elaborate on the work that we do, which you know uh, it's intentionally uh, uh, inclusive. You know, uh, based on what uh, you know, my colleague Koketo has already uh, indulged us on. However, I just want to indicate that you know beyond just PI. You know, through our legal department, we do what we call a uh, transformation hearings, you know, in, in, uh, in, in both public and private sector. And in fact, there has been a, 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 a transformation hearings, you know, in institutions of higher learning. <coughs> Excuse me. There's been a, a transformation hearings in, in institutions of higher learning because uh, as the commission, it is actually within our constitutional mandate to make sure that uh, uh, we hold uh, everyone, you know, uh, accountable. So transformation hearings, uh, issues of monitoring and holding institutions accountable is central to our work. And we do acknowledge, uh, you know, the, the, the gap that was indicated earlier, you know, in the research presentation, you know, as far as uh, not being that inclusive because, you know, the question of uh, inclusivity, the question of uh, not looking, you know, at the world in a binary form is very important. And that is why in our, in, in our outreach activities, you know, both out and in, you know, just social institutions, we make sure that the question of inclusivity is very important. So I will end there. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Mr. Arlington. Okay. I'll then um, hand over to Mr. Shuping to just make brief comments. Thank you. Um, just to make the audience aware that we will also be having a presentation by the legal department regarding what the activities the legal department has conducted. That is actually a core presentation of the transformation reports as well. Um, they will also take you through the, a lot of issues that have been identified. Of importance is to note that the, the functions of our research department is, as you would have heard in the presentations and the findings thereof, they assist in investigating specific nuances and issues that are emanating and what the causes thereof are. And as you would have seen, we noted the lack of policies of inclusion and diversity. And from the research work, also this um, a parallel function from the work of public education and information, which has been presented. So in our view, it is not necessarily that what the, the public education was saying, the CGE did in educating the um, learner students at the universities through its functions, does not necessarily mean that it, it's, it's actually contradicting what research is conducting. And also the programs that the CG indicated that it conducted and, and throughout different um, ent uh, entities or universities and colleges. It uh, shows that um, that is the way that CGE is, is actually doing. It does not necessarily mean that it, it is the way that the university itself through its own programs has done. Therefore, through our research, the legal department has noted through the, our transformation hearings as well. You will also hear there are recommendations from the legal department that addresses the issues that are picked up through the uh, legal department. So therefore, uh, it's not entirely um, 
the case that the functions of the, the um, or our recommendations are necessarily contradicting, but we need to look at them from the angle of understanding the functions of each unit within the um, CGE. And emphasis is placed back on our recommendations in implementing them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chikwi. Um, HOD from the Public Information Department would also like to share brief words about um, the responses in this, about this presentation. Okay, thank you, Program Director. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. I just want to first start by actually acknowledging all the questions and concerns that we shared to say that they are actually very encouraging, I think, firstly, and secondly, um, um, those inputs that we shared um, is obviously um, are things that we will just look at as we move forward so that we can just see to it that we come closer to um, the concerns that we raised. But I think what I wanted to actually focus on was the question, last question that was asked to say what assistance um, um, are we supposed to give to these universities um, um, given the presentation that we've actually shared and highlighting gaps that we've since identified. I just want to say for this date, Institutions are more than welcome to actually approach us. Um, 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 I'll tell you why I'm saying this. If you look into all these issues and also into all these gaps that have been actually identified, we can clearly see that there's issues there of lack of accountability, first of all. But then second, becoming to PI, I think oh, my colleague, Ken Sani, um, Rabu, The actual department, we then actually encouraging these institutions that if for whatever the reason you have issues in terms of not knowing what to do, talk to us, come to us, we will be able to actually work with you and, and, and take you through the gender mainstreaming, the gender and development framework so that these can be institutionalized. I just wanted to say that program director. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that. I will now hand over to the last speaker to do a presentation on the gender transformation reports that we had brief comments from Mr. Alex Zimmer and Mr. Shuping about. Now I'll just hand over to Mr. Sorry, apologies for that. Ms. Mamelo Matthews. Ms. Matthews, please unmute yourself. Yes, good morning colleagues um, and stakeholders. Um, I'm Ms. Mamelo Matthews. I'm the legal officer for the Western Cape and also um, assisting my lead, um, Ms. Tembi Madalani, um, in the investigation into the transformation reports on institutions of higher learning. Um, let me just, firstly, can everyone see my screen? Am I sharing? Not yet. Not yet. Let me do that quickly. How about now? Yes, we yes, can you see are. something. Yeah. Okay. So, um, just a thumbs up. Is it everyone? Is this visible to everyone? Thank yes. you. Yes. Perfect. Um, so first of all, I'm very excited to be presenting this report um, after hearing the robust engagement that has happened this morning and the very important questions um, that were asked um, by and addressed by our esteemed stakeholders. Um, so I'm excited because it shows that the concept around this particular investigation in, in, in respect of the legal department is on the right path in relation to um, addressing the needs of the public, um, public students. So I'm not going to go through the mandate of the CGE as this has already been addressed, but I'd like to start by saying that during the fiscal years of 2014 to 2023, 
Um, the Commission undertook a series of investigative hearings. Um, these investigative hearings were aimed at uh, various universities, as um, my HOD pointed out at the beginning, in terms of the um, various reports and the titles of the various reports over the years. These hearings, these hearings included both public institutions of higher learning as well as private institutions of higher learning. So your TVET colleges were included as a sample um, in respect of the transformation hearings and then all the public universities um, that were that we as South Africa know. Um, however, in terms of limitation, other private institutions like your previously known as Parson, um, Parsons, but now, or Pearsons, but now it, it was, um, and your varsity colleges, those weren't included in the study. And so maybe they might, based on the comment made by um, one of our guests, um, those, there might be a gap there to also look into those institutions because they are genuinely private, private institutions. Um, so we took a, uh, undertook a series of investigative hearings aimed at e examining the state of transformation within the higher education sector. In pursuit of this objective, the Commission issued subpoenas to the universities and technical vocational education training colleges, so TVET colleges, compelling the attendance. What's happening? Is this manual? The hearings were driven by several overarching goals. Firstly, they sought to evaluate the effectiveness of employment equity legislation in promoting gender equality within these institutions. So I just want you to keep in mind that this is between 2013 um, till now. And so although in our evaluation, there was a question about are we looking at programs that are that are not just binary, that also incorporate non-binary persons? Um, and so you will see as I present in terms of the gaps identified that there has been a massive gap in terms of what was considered gender transformation um, during 2013 leading up to now and how because of the change in culture and climate that we find ourselves as a nation and as the world, how gender transformation has the, the investigation of what gender transformation actually means starts to include the LGBTIQ um, plus community and binary and non-binary persons. So I just, I want you to have that at the back of your mind as we go through this presentation. Um, secondly, the, um, we aimed to hold higher education institutions accountable for any failures to comply with gender transformation mandates. So what this meant is that when we received the information that we requested from the, from the universities and the various TV colleges, we took that information, analyzed it, and compared, to, compared it to what, was, what they were telling us they are doing versus what they are not doing in terms of what is clear, the undertones of what is not happening versus what is needed to be happening. And based on that, the hearing was conducted. So we allowed for the various institutions to come forward, make their presentations as to how they felt they were achieving or lacking in the achievement if they were, if they were that self-aware. Um, and then as, as the Commission, then making our presentations in highlighting what the gaps were and making recommendations in terms of what needed to be done to bridge those gaps. So that was generally the, the way the hearings were conducted. And then obviously a report would follow and then follow-ups would follow throughout the, the following fiscal year. Um, the hearings endeavoured to identify specific vulnerabilities and risks faced by women in these settings, both as employees and as students. Um, and so, like I said, this is from 2013, and as we moved on, 
understanding that gender is not just a binary issue or a binary aspect, that gender includes non-binary persons as well, we started looking at more than just what risks are faced by women, but what risks are faced by a group of minorities in the gender spectrum, such as women as well as other minorities, um, like by non-binary persons, uh, non-gender conforming persons as well. Additionally, these pre proceedings were designed to offer guidance to universities and colleges on overcoming barriers that hinder the progress of, back then, women and persons with disabilities at various levels across different sectors within the academic environment. After these hearings, the Commission compiled findings and disseminated them among key stakeholders in the same way that I've just explained previously. So these included previously, these also included the Department of Higher Education and Training, the Ministerial Task Team, the Employment Equity Commission and the Department of Labor and Parliament through quarterly reports submitted to um, the Portfolio Committee on Women. So we looked at those reports as well to see what was being said in terms of the objective that we were trying to reach as an institution. The report concerning the fiscal year 2020 delineated the Commission for Gender Equality's strategic emphasis on higher education institutions. A decision influenced by, and this decision was influenced by an alarming media revelation or revelations in the media and grievances that were also lodged to the Commission, both um, by both sector employees and students concerning investment concerning sex for marks um, scandals um, within the institution of um, higher institutions of higher education um, as well as so when these came in we had to then look also back at what has where are we or where are they the institutions that we have called before us in terms of their pace of transformation and is it including where we are now as a nation and where we are now as a society, a global society? And so we identified that there is clear evidence of a lethargic pace when it comes to transformation regarding um, the LGBTIQA um, groups and other marginalized um, groups such as um, transgender persons and non-binary persons. So what that means is that they are not really considered in the language of transformation. And so um, there's sort of an apathy or um, an apathy associated with including them in the process of transformation. Um, additionally, a need was identified during the 2014 hearings um, for the Commission to deeply engage with the institutions of higher learning on advancing pla the placement of women and persons with disabilities in senior management roles and on the formulation of gender policies. The initial hearings were held in November, um, dates 25th to 28th to, four, to, to I beg your pardon, 2014, featuring participation from the Department of Higher Education and Training and the University of South Africa and the University of Vendor. So these were the, the stakeholders that were um, subpoenaed to appear before the Commission in 2014. The 2014 um, report specifically addressed the second, no, this, this presentation specifically addresses the second round of hearings that were con um, conducted in 2015, um, which summoned the testimonies and representatives of the University of Pretoria, Northwest University, Tswane University of Technology, all of these institutions in 2015 then came before the Commission under the same um, rationale as the institutions that appeared in the previous year. So I just want to remind you that it's not just a hearing, findings and recommendations made and then we move on. In the following financial year, there are undertakings that have been made in terms of recommendations and findings. And so we as the Commission then follow up with the institutions requesting um, biannual reports in terms of progress made in respect of the recommendations 
made in the previous year. So although I'm not mentioning them under 2015, under 2015 they were considered follow-up investigations, which is all on paper in terms of communication written. So they don't necessarily appear before the Commission again. So in 2015, as I stated, it was the uh, um, University of Pretoria, Northwest University, and Swana University of Technology um, appeared before the Commission. These proceedings happened to coincide with the These Must Fall protests, which highlighted universities' transformation deficit, um, deficits. So this was a really interesting time for the Commission um, in respect of the kind of data that we were hoping would be available to us in terms of challenging the issue of transformation. So we're not just, it tells you that then the focus was not just on racial transformation or gender transformation, but also financial transformation, which is, which intersects with, you know, with all aspects that we were actually looking at. The hearings aimed to evaluate, again, the Employment Equities Act the Employment Equity Act's impact, holding the public sector accountable for legislative non-compliance, enhancing awareness on national legislation and international commitments relevant to gender equality. And I want to stress this as it's very important for me to make a note of this in my presentation that, yes, we look at national legislation and yes, nationally, we have an obligation, but there's also an international obligation that we as South Africa has signed ourselves to. So the question of how do we hold them accountable or who holds them accountable? Essentially, we are holding universities accountable at a micro scale or level in terms of national legislation and their responsibilities to adhere to the national legislation. But in terms of this year's report, the idea is to have a macro look at it where we say, okay, we, we hear that Universities are not complying. And why are they not complying? Is it a lack of understanding? Is it fiscal limitations? Is there no, um, is there lack of collaboration working with the state? Is the state not taking this seriously? The state now being the Department of Higher Education. And so we then have to look at, you know, it becomes a domino effect. So we have to look at, are we actually as a country meeting our commitments, our international commitments, when it comes to gender equality. We also had to discern the vulnerabilities and risks of women face, that women face in the workplace sectors and then share best practices um, from the complaint institutions. And again, I'm going to stress this, that back then the focus was on women, but as the climate has changed, we now include um, uh, the minorities um, such as non-binary persons. Access to workplace transformation measures were concerning, um, measures concerning gender and disability inclusion and ascertain employer non-compliance with equality promoting labor legislation provisions. Comes back to what I was saying, where we, were look, we looked at it at a micro level and scrutinized um, what the institutions were doing and whether they were complying. I mean, I'm meeting. Sorry. A significant gender disparity in. So, the major findings in terms of these reports was that there's a significant uh, gender disparity in top management. Um, so, at that time, we saw that there was 75% male versus 25% female. There was an under representation of African females at professional levels, um, more pronounced among. Um, colored and Indian staff members. Only 0.5% of the staff composition comprised of persons with disabilities, which is shocking that it's not even 1%. It's not even a half a percent um, in terms of representation. And this was across board. Um, ambiguity regarding, um, there was ambiguity regarding um, Tut's gender focal point. Um, due to non-specific information, and this was based on the this was based on the information that you get given to us for analysis, and so we, as the commission, identified that it was very ambiguous as to um, what the gender focal point um, was. 
There was also a lack of detailed data on funds specifically allocated for gender transformation. So it wasn't clear cut that X university has this much that they have allocated um, for gender transformation. This is how they spend it. This is the what they managed to achieve with the budget that they had or what they did not manage to achieve. So yeah, it was clear that because of that lack of detail, it may not have been um, a priority. Dependency on its transformation, employment equity and diversity that directed it for monitoring advancements without specifying forum frequencies. So again, it was reported that these things exist, but it wasn't clear in the data what the what free, at what frequency they were meeting, what were um, the meeting objectives, what were met, what were not met, what are the limitations. So again, it you know it gives it a tone of we are just doing what we have to do, but it's not really a priority as to whether it is working or it how it is working if it is. Existence of an employee talent acquisition policy, not necessarily prioritizing women or persons with um, disabilities. So basically, we looked at um, what is your policy say on retaining talent, acquiring talent when it comes to uh, women or persons with disabilities. Um, your figures are really low percentage wise. Is there prioritize, are you prioritizing it in terms of your strategic plan for the year? or um, for the years to come to improve those figures. No, evidence showed that it was not necessarily um, a, priori a priority. A comprehensive sexual harassment policy earning um, commendation despite incomplete case details since 2012. Um, so some had sexual harassment policies, others didn't. Um, and so some had really comprehensive policies. However, when you looked at the, um, the completeness of investigation of cases of alleged sexual harassment, the two did not speak to each other. So this, um, this really comprehensive sexual harassment policy did not result in actual completed cases in the time required. Um, or even um, in, um, even investigations carried out and completed. So that was really concerning. Um, there was unspecified, unspecified success stories and a lack of information on unisex facilities um, for LGBTIQ community and non-binary persons. This, over the last couple of years, has become really prevalent. Um, and I think we as a society are paying more attention um, to the needs of um, the um, minorities, such as the LGBTIQ plus community. Um, and a lot of, through engagement with a lot of universities and students outside of the hearings, we are recognizing that students are wanting to be visible on campus. So they want facilities, facilities that make them feel safe and included. Um, they want processes, administrative processes that make them feel included and visible and part of the university community. And for, of course, as we, it is known by all of us that this has not been happening. Um, and so again, the rationale for this particular investigation for this year is to look at that very big gap. When you look at admin, admission policies, when you look at allocation of um, residential facilities for students, when you look at um, for, um, facilities, um, healthcare facilities for students, are they genuinely inclusive or are they only inclusive in a binary sense? Um, and so there's a massive gap when you look at what is needed by students um, within the minority and what is actually available to them at institutions. The commission concluded the transformation, they concluded that while transformation is underway, its pace was 
unsatisfactorily slow. Um, and I, I feel that that would be a sentiment that everyone um, agrees with, everyone on this platform, that yes, we see that institutions are saying that they're making these efforts and they're putting these policies in place, um, or that they are willing to learn about putting such policies in place, but the speed or the pace at which we need them to move at doesn't correlate with the express desire to comply and make um, an institution that is truly transformative. Most policies reviewed highlighted, most policies reviewed by ourselves highlighted a need for finalized and approved policy submissions um, to en enhance accountability and transparency um, in gender issue governance. Um, this, it, this particular slide speaks to Tut University based on the report findings for this particular year, 2015. However, um, it is very relevant for me to speak in a general sense because this is what we have noticed in terms of identifying gaps that led to this um, investigation for this year, that this exists across board. It's not just a TUT problem. It is a problem in both private institutions and public institutions. Um, and so that's why I keep highlighting a cross board. So one of our stakeholders um, mentioned earlier about the need for accountability, and there's absolutely a need for continuous oversight and trans and accountability, because you find that they will create programs, but without the assistance or without the partnership of institutions that are experts in this field um, and I'm not and I'm saying the CGE as well as other institutions NGOs if they're not working together with these institutions you will find that the policies will never on the ground work for the, the real needs of the students because it doesn't help to provide the CGE or the Department of Higher Education with all these wonderful transformative policies but there's no application of it on the ground, and there's no evidence of true satisfaction by the of the or by the constituents who these policies are to um, speak to, and um, these policies are to cater to. Um, and so, yes, oversight and accountability needs to happen throughout continuously. The Commission pursued its investigation into ongoing transformation within higher institution. Institutions such as the University of South Africa, Department of Higher Education and Training. Um, so this is now the following year where, again, we had follow-ups with the 2015 universities and then we had um, another batch of universities come before us. This included um, Chuane University of Technology, University of Cape Town, Witwatersrand, KwaZulu Natal, and Rhodes University. Um, again, were amongst the institutions that were scrutinized in the way the previous institutions were um, scrutinized in the previous years. Uh, testimonies from these hearings underscored the ongoing marginalization of women in the workplace, so despite South Africa's progressive legal framework for gender equality. The Commission recognized the significant advancements made by those three universities um, towards aligning with the country's transformation agenda. The University of Johannesburg, specifically its leadership, made a note, made, had made notable progress in establishing one of the most racially and gender transformed management teams. The appointment of Professor Peterson at the University of Free State was seen as a positive step towards um, evaluating the university's status further. Stellenbosch University received comm um, commendation for its transformation plan along with its dedicated personnel and budgetary commitments towards the implementation of such a plan. However, concerns remained across these institutions regarding gender diversity and equality integration into student orientation and staff induction programs um, in respect of consultation on LGBTIQIA plus inclusivity and addressing gender and racial pay disparities. So as you can see now, we are starting to 
move the trajectory. We're now following a, a trajectory that we find ourselves at now. So we're no longer looking at a binary gender diversity and inclusion. We're now looking to include non-binary as well. A gender-focused approach in academic staff and recruitment and membering, member, um, mentoring retention strategies to reduce turnover rates. So those were so what I'm um, highlighting now are just aspects that we looked at or that we pointed out during those particular hearings. Um, it was important for them, for the institutions to go back and create a supportive work environment for female staff and enhance gender representation in decision making um, bodies like university council. So what we found at that time was that, yes, the um, quote unquote, they were meeting their quotas, but some of them, not all of them. However, when you look at whether, when it came to decision-making bodies who was present, they were still lacking. So it became a question of, is this just lip service? Are you doing this to meet your quotas and to keep yourselves within the parameters of the legal framework, or are you actually incorporating transformation into your institution? During 2018 and to 2019, additional universities were selected for the participation in the hearings, similar, very similar to the previous ones. These universities included University of Zululand, Nelson Mandela University, Saul Plaik University, Pumalanga University, and the Department of Higher Education and Training again. Um, for Saul Plaik University, observations indicated at that time under representation of women in top and senior management roles, lack of employment for persons with disabilities, absence of subjects for deaf and visually impaired students, leading to discrimination claims. Um, back then, we also picked up inadequate campus security measures, lack of several key policies, including those on gender and HIV AIDS management, among others. Um, for the University of Mpumalanga, back then, recommendations focused on appointing a senior manager as a gender transformation manager to implement the employment equity plan against patriarchal norms, drafting a comprehensive gender policy with clear responsibilities, um, sensitizing university community members through dialogues or workshops, developing policies around recruitment and selection, among other things. So these were um, aspects the commission needed um, University of Mpumalanga to focus on in respect to reaching transformation within the institution. Despite some progress made by certain higher education institutions towards recruiting female candidates as well as persons with disabilities into academic positions and top senior management roles, by 2020 overall progress towards achieving this remained slow. And so back then it was recommended that um, that the universities needed to emphasize um, and align their policies with international instruments because they just were not made, they were just not meeting what was required of them. All right, so now TV colleges were done in the fiscal year 2020 to 2021, and similar to um, the model used for high um, universities. Um, the commission undertook to do transformation hearings for TBED colleges um, and placing a, sub, a significant emphasis on TBED colleges for that year. So the hearings involve, um, involved participation from several institutions. Gandala um, was one of them, Northern Cape Urban TBED College is one of them, South Gauteng, Waterberg um, TBED College. And this, these hearings took place in November 2022, I mean 2020, my apologies, and it was both a qualitative, the methodology used was both qualitative and quantitative. So what we did as the commission is that we developed a questionnaire focusing on assessing transformation practices within these colleges. And the questionnaire was, the aim of the questionnaire was to address compliance or non-compliance successes, um, non-compliance, successes, challenges, and policy gaps against, it was a comparison against local, regional, and international benchmarks for transformation. 
what we as the Commission found upon analysis of the data received from all these participating colleges that I mentioned was that, that there were um, the Commission considered several factors such as gender representation across occupational categories. So we looked at was the gender representation and trans, um, evidence of transformation um, across race, disability inclusion, safety of the students, as well as what we consider to be reasonable accommodation. The Commission's efforts have led to notable recognitions of advancements in some institutions towards aligning um, with the country's transformation agenda. However, despite these progresses, there remains significant gaps and areas requiring urgent attention. And so what I'm going to speak about next in the next couple of slides is the identification of the gaps. So what we did was we went through all of those reports that existed, saw what was required in year one where they failed, saw what they did in year two upon the follow-up years, um, and looked at did was the was the evidence of change. Um, and then so we've taken all those reports identified what was required of them and then looked at where we are today and based on what was required of them then and what is required of institutions now in respect of what transformation is we then identified gaps that we thought we need to explore and so the gaps included the slow pace of transformation so while some universities had made strides towards gender equality um, as i stated earlier in the in the presentation there was overall a slow pace of transformation across higher education sector, and it was unsatisfactory. Uh, the slow progression underscores a need for more explicit and tangible gender transformation policies, and policies that include non-binary persons. Underrepresentation, there's a significant underrepresentation of women and non-binary persons um, particularly African females at all professional levels, um, as well as persons with disabilities um, across higher education institutions. There was an insufficient recruitment efforts to target underrepresented designated groups, as well as a minimal use of academic networks to identify scholars from these groups. Um, policy ambiguity and non-compliance was a big factor in what we noted. Many institutions lacked clear or finalized gender policies leading to an ambiguity when it comes to their gender focal points, as well as an ineffective governance regarding gender issues. Additionally, there was also notable non-compliance with obligations aimed at fostering gender equality within the workplace, as well as within um, the, the community for students. Um, lack of support facilities, the absence of child care or plans for the establishment in many institutions indicated a gap for supporting women's participation, higher education movements. Again, um, I mentioned earlier the lack of administrative inclusivity when it comes to non-binary persons. So uh, allowing for a, um, a person, a transgender person, to have their dead name removed from the degree and um, have the name that they are going by on the current degree. Um, also, in terms of gender markers to be represented uh, the way um, they identify. So these are all issues that we are picking up that are missing. So the question then we have to ask, is there really transformation in that regard? And the answer is no. Sexual harassment policies, despite um, commendations from previous comprehensive sexual harassment policies, remember earlier in the presentation I mentioned that some universities had great policies. However, when you looked at the outcome of resolution of investigation of cases, those policies were not evident on the ground. Um, and so other universities either did not have sexual harassment policies or had very outdated ones, which means it was not something that was prioritized in terms of um, maintaining um, the maintaining the development. Inadequate data on gender 
the transformation funding, again, I mentioned earlier, a lot of universities, with the exception of Stellenbosch, did not have data to show us what is budgeted for gender transformation if it's within your institution. And those of you who do have some kind of a budget, how, how, what objectives have you met with these budgets and what limitations have you faced due to these budgets? Um, and then as, note, as pointed out by our stakeholders in the previous um, conversations that we've had on this platform, insufficient engagement with LGBTI issues. Um, and again, showing that there's a lethargic pace when it comes to transformation um, concerning LGBTI inclusivity within the institutions of um, higher learning. So it was also observed that there was a lack of special, specialized sexual health programs for women or LGBTIQ um, individuals. And yes, we understand that it can be financially or fiscally limiting um, to, like, not everyone has great budgets to carry out um, these services. However, even a referral system um, to an to a unit, um, to a place that, you know, um, to a clinic or a hospital, sorry, um, for these services do not exist. Um, and so one has to ask, are you really scratching in all corners and are you really looking at all avenues as an institution of higher learning? Non-compliance with employment equity targets. So there was an ongoing non-compliance with um, employment equity targets and gender responsive budgeting and management. That was clear as we were going through the reports. Lastly, it was observed that overall the TVET colleges failed to implement CGE's recommendations adequately due to lack of support from the Department of Higher Education. Um, and I think this highlights the point that was illustrated by one of our um, stakeholders when she said that when they said that um, you find that at private institutions they just did the policies don't exist they are not implementing anything it's just a free for all in terms of violation in that respect um, and so that also became very clear to us as we went through the reports um, lack of comprehensive strategies the absence of strategic initiatives to monitor or promote advancement of women in top management or um, roles or allocate budgets for gender transformation, that was also something that came up all the time as a gap as we went through all those reports. Um, and then safety from gender-based violence. So ensuring safety from gender-based violence remained a significant challenge that required comprehensive policies and supportive programs for victims. And so Considering everything that I've just mentioned, it is why we find ourselves in the fiscal year of 24, 25, undertaking this investigation. So this particular investigation that we are doing is an audit of all the years. So we're going back to all the institutions we've ever had before us, and we would like all the data from then to now to basically measure through auditing what they have done, where the transformation has taken place, whether they have been serious about transformation, what it has meant for, for employees, what it has meant for, um, meant for students um, overall. So this, to answer the question of how do we hold them accountable or who holds them accountable, this is going to be a tool for accountability. So once we can, once we can identify where the transformation has happened and has it happened at a satisfactory pace, are students um, somewhat satisfied? Because we will not always be satisfied all the time. Um, where there are gaps that, or just explicit evidence of genuine non-compliance, um, we will be taking this um, forward to the ministers and having engagement with um, key strategic persons within this, within government to address these. Um, yeah, and so the objective of this is what we've done, so, sorry, I've already 
uh, address the objective. What we have done to this point um, is that we've dispatched letters to about 28 institutions requesting all these documents, namely your employment equity policy and plan and evidence of implementation. So not just the plan we need to see from the time you were before us until the year what um, evidence of implementation exists, recruitment and selection policies, as well as we will see where there's in your stats whether there's evidence that these policies are um, speaking or at least are framing transformation, training and development policies, succession and retention policies, human resource operation policies, sexual harassment policies. In respect of the sexual harassment policies, institutions are further required to provide evidence of case management which will include the status of such matters. We also want policy on gender-based violence and femicide. This is to include evidence of programs and initiatives that the universities have used to address GBV if within their institutions. Policies and evidence of implementation of gender sensitivity training, and this will include um, gender sensitivity training when it comes to non-binary persons and the inclusion of non-binary persons within the institution community. Policies in relation to gender diverse students and employees, policies relating to inclusive, inclusivity in accessing healthcare services, policies relating to inclusivity with student housing accommodation, um, policies on interim procedures to support the right to change sex description, descriptors on identity documents such as student cards and employee cards, policies that support a right to name change on institutional associated documents, policies and provisions within the disciplinary framework of the institution that regulate the prevention and of harassment and discrimination towards trans and gender diverse persons, sorry. And upon receipt of these documents requested, we will then do a comparative analysis, which speaks to what I spoke to earlier, that speaks to the auditing and the determination, as well as the sort of the barometer marking of whether transformation is indeed taking place in institutions of higher education, um, higher learning. I also want to um, state that the, the Commission has shared via a survey on Microsoft Forms with all these institutions as well as our partners a QR code to be shared with students for them to complete the survey so that we can get, the idea was to get the student's perspective on what is available to them um, and what is not available and what they wish to see, what transformation would it really mean to them, like what does it amount to for them as um, non-binary students. And so I'm pleased to say that some um, responses have been coming in in terms of this um, the survey. So we'll be able to also use that as a measuring stick or measuring tool in terms of whether um, the transformation that the universities perceive themselves to be conducting really does translate within the student communities. Thank you very much for your time and patience. Um, thank you very much, Mrs. Um, Matthews, for the presentation. I will now um, open the last session of questions and answers. Are there any questions in the boardroom? I'll then move over to the delegates online. Are there any questions online? Um, Portia, you may proceed with your questions. In a true sense of everything, it is not a question. But first of all, I would like to applaud a CGE for the good work that is known. But I just want to raise an awareness. CGE is working. I told people after the seminar, the GBVF seminar, to say CGE is working. However, the challenge is that most of the time CGE is working at a top-down approach. I'm sitting in this meeting as a professional, and I'm sitting in this meeting as a person who's coming from civil society, so I could identify the gap. So people from higher level and professionals would say, yeah, CGE is working. But however, at the ground level, Several society organizations are not engaged. They don't know about these things because most of them are happening at the higher level without their involvement. For an example, um, there were advocacy work that was done uh, in terms of gender and employment, 
they don't know about that. And some of them, they deal with economic empowerment programs. Some of them, they're dealing with women issues, but they are not involved. So when you come in settings whereby there are civil society organizations and you report these things, they don't know about them because they were never there. The strategy that I suggested immediately after, because I went to two provinces to say, guys, you are working, but make sure that there is involvement of people at the ground level. For that, do things with them so that they can be able to form pattern and parcel of everything that you're doing. For an example, uh, with the second presentation, the PEI, we were talking about um, the dialogues that are done, yara, 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 yara. That is where it is supposed to be the foundation where work has to be done. Because research is not only formal, it can also be informal. So when you do those, you need to have some learning on what is it that people at the ground level are saying? What is it that they are seeing? What are the suggestions? And if maybe you go to two, three institutions, you find similarities, then that should inform a, a research. So when you do that, step by step by step, you go with them. The presentation listed so many organizations that you can think of. It spoke of people with disability. It spoke of gender equality. It spoke of HIV AIDS. It spoke of LGBTI. So you can imagine how many organizations at the ground level they could be put on board. And trust it, I know, at, at CGE does not have human resource capacity involving them because they get funding it will lessen the load of work that cge is carrying because these organizations will be the ones after you have laid a good foundation to run with almost everything trust me when i'm telling you they will be proud to write a report to say we were working with cge these were the findings cge this this is what we've done but if we leave them out we are leaving the tool the resources and more importantly um capacity so if maybe to avoid this thing to say i don't like it you know to say cge is not working cge is not working involve people at the ground level so that you can get better results so that when you present yes we know yeah so that they can be even able to defend because now the advocacy work that was done was done with group of people at the higher level people at the ground level are not there and it is so sad because i as a social worker i used to refer people to houghton office okay so i used to refer the lgbti cases they were attended to it is only me as a professional that knows about those cases, those people are left going out after being assisted. You go to this meeting, still nobody talks. When you come as a professional reporting those things, yeah, just because you're no longer an activist, you're a professional, you are on the side of the CGE. So those are the minor things that I a little bit worried that I wish CGE could look at and polish a little bit. Thank you so much. Thank you, Portia. I'll now hand over to Lisa. Thank you so much and um, um, thank you for the last presentation and the inclusion of LGBTI concerns through it. Um, I'm going to try and be very brief. Um, I, I find that, um, you know, there's sort of very diplomatic ways that we are saying that the Department of Higher Education and Training is not living up to their, to their mandate. Um, I, I particularly liked um, the words lethargic um, pace. Um, so just to be very clear, um, we've had our constitution for 26 years. Um, I think after 26 years of supposed gender, sexual orientation, sex, equality, that we're still discussing things in this way is, is it's beyond lethargic. This is not lethargic. Um, and I think that it is, it is worth kind of really encouraging um everyone anyone anyone and everyone to 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 be less tentative in this thing this is blatant and extreme non-compliance by a state organization even after instruction from national government even under our constitution under all of our law that is in place for equality, it is not it non-compliance at this level is beyond lethargic. It is hostile. 
And if the Department of Education and Training is hostile to equality and hostile to inclusion, and is blatantly still heterosexist, patriarchal, and and um, sexist, that that this these words need to be very clearly stated. Um, and please, can I ask the CGE that one um, one very clear way of addressing this is looking at the budget. Somehow the Department of Higher Education and Training took the, the, the letters LGBTIQA plus out of their approach to gender-based violence and, and, and their response to gender-based violence on campus. How did they take those words out when there was an instruction from national government to include those words? And with those letters taken out, what was the budget allocation to LGBTI inclusion? What has been the budget allocation to training around gender diversity and LGBTI issues? And what is the budget allocation to LGBTI suicides amongst tertiary, in, in tertiary institutions? What's the ballot budget allocation to the dropout rate of LGBTI students from our tertiary institutions? And money is a very easy way to look at this issue. And as far as I've seen, and I could be entirely wrong because I have not had um, long in um, to be able to research this or the resources to be able to research this. But as far as I've seen so far, that the budget allocation to LGBTI inclusion to challenge homophobia has been about zero from the DHET, even considering the amount of budget they've been given to address GBV. So if a CGE could specifically look at the budget allocation to this issue with DHET, but with all of the other um, mandated ministries to address GBV, what has been, where's the money? That would be my question. Where is the money for, for inclusion, for scholarships, for transformation officers, for LGBTI training, for LGBTI awareness. And, and where is the legal action against this hostility and this non-compliance and this, this, this lethargy, this slowness? Where is the legal and the, 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 the sanctions against continuously ignoring our law? Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I will now hand over to Emily. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to all on the platform and those who are in the room. And I want to uh, appreciate the presentation that has been done. And also coming to what Lisa has just indicated. Lisa has just presented the number of things that I would like to work on. The challenge is now going to be uh, highlighted looking at the issue of the budget. If the non-compliance has been uh, so blatant for over a period of time, now they are just going to throw the budget cuts at our faces and it, the non-compliance is going to continue. Uh, I am from the SAPS and the police are always left to pick up the pieces where uh, the gender-based violence, especially with uh, the non-binary uh, uh, community, so that we have to deal with that. So I don't know what else can be done. Maybe it's something that we can look at uh, to say what else can be done uh, to ensure that the policies that are in place get to be implemented. At the present moment, the implementation is far and few in between if any, and the, the, those who are not complying, uh, there is no uh, consequences in, in terms of those non-compliance. So it's just a comment, but also to highlight uh, the issues, to confirm the issues that have already been highlighted in terms of non-compliance. I thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Emily, I will now move over to Principal Chief Machine. 
Um, principal, please switch off your video. Your network is quite bad. Switch off. Yes, yeah, so that we can hear you properly. Thank you. You're just a bit soft. Okay. Um, oh, I, I'm, I'm grateful to have this opportunity. So we also hear about this, uh, the gender-based violence, which is everywhere. It's happening to everywhere, home, community, school, work, uh, realities, I can mention. But the thing is, we hear that there are people who are working uh, uh, to, under the, the program, but we are rare to see them in our community. And gender-based violence is only is it's also affecting many people and even men. It's not only because, as you can see, people men end up killing women because of of the they the, the, they are not listened when they are reporting that they are being abused. They are say such a thing that are happening in their homes. So they are not taking taken serious. They end up taking matters on their hands. So we we want everyone to to teach or to be listened or to be something to to be done about it. Uh, if I can say, uh, poverty also something that gets in uh, in their homes. People fighting of hunger. They are not working. They do anything that it can be. Sometimes someone is, is protecting himself in at home because of not affording. That, that that's where starting. I think I'm talking about lower classes. I don't know uh, up there, but I'm talking to to the about the lower classes. Um, again, there was another uh, women against poverty and hunger. There is this woman is just been launched. And people are getting grossly there. They are paying only 300 grand. And suddenly, people, they saw the hope. That is closed by government because they said where the money is coming from. But everyone is paying 300, and that uh, 300 and food was delivered to the people. People were starting to behave. And now, if now that bank is closed, women, people cannot get food. Poor people cannot get food. They start to, to do what? That is a violence because now they are, they, are, they are not happy with that because everyone on the ground do something to assist because we do see what is happening around our community as we are sitting. But we decide let's do something to help. But those people who are on the higher classes, they don't understand, but they have power of everything. So it is emotionally to other people who are on the on the ground that end up doing what that is is a part of gender violence because now people will get stressed again. I'm sorry to bring this, but it's what we see around. Uh, I'm a chief. I'm from Marshall Royal Kingdom. I am uh, always with a community, so I always observe everything that is happening. So please, these uh, officials come here on the ground to see what is happening. Help people. People are so really stressed. That is where the gender-based uh, violence comes from. Thank you. Thank you, Principal. I'll now hand over to Busisi. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, once again, um, afternoon. My question is just very simple. Um, I've heard from all the uh, presenters that they are mentioning uh, institutions of higher learning, which is universities and technicons and TVET uh, colleges. So my question is uh, on community colleges. Uh, uh, do you actually pay visit to community colleges to actually uh, 
find out everything that we have done with universities because I did not see them, especially on slide 31, where you mentioned that it is ineffective governance by college councils. And I assumed that it's TVET colleges and only um, higher institutions of learning, which is um, universities. Whereas community colleges, they're also part of post-school education and, and training system. Thank you. Um, I see there aren't any further questions online. I'll now hand over to Mr. Shipping to address, to provide his responses. Thank you. Um, I will take um, some of the questions that um, the post been um, in the, through the engagements when we started just to see that we are addressing the, these aspects. I think it's to start with the intention of this engagement it, it is that we must um, welcome your input and take it into account so that in line with the annual performance plan of this financial year, we deliver we will deliver into this uh, engagement of today so that we, we get your input and we we are actually welcome. Now, what is important now from this engagement as per the purpose that was highlighted, the aim is to approach the president in line with the, the Commission for Gender Equality Act, where it's able to approach the president on the issues of transformation of gender in the country. And in approaching the president, we are looking for that uh, appropriate recourse or remedy to this situation of slow pace of transformation. You would have heard from all these reports and this presentation that we, we are linking and, and those issues identified clearly, they need to be addressed. Now, the reality is that as, as we are speaking, we do not have the legislation which consolidates and ensures uniformity uh, and handling of these matters by the universities. Currently, we can see it's clear that universities, colleges, addresses these issues autonomously, and it is then a problem where there is no uh, legislation in place which uh, forces these institutions to deal with transforming in the same way, the handling of sexual harassment in the same way, and even the structures dealing with this transformation to be the same, so that it is not difficult then that despite the policies in place, that we are having, for an example, workplace policies, which requires the creation of conducive working environment. These universities, when you look at them, they handle these issues differently. I will just cite a budget issue, for an example. All the universities differ in as far as what are they allocating to them. And therefore, what can bring this back now to, to, to holding them accountable? And then it goes back to saying, in absence of the uniform legislation and validity of this, we, we would forever then be held back in, in as far as transformation is, is concerned. And therefore now, uh, both the TVET colleges and the universities, they all uh, handle all these issues differently. And hence the CGSO, they need to bring this um, approach for, for for the need for a legislation that can standardize the, the, the handling of this, so that one you would have seen the court uh, each and every university, it has unique recommendations because issues were handled differently. One, they excel in others, and others they actually underperform in other areas. Therefore, it will then take us to work um, all the, the colleges and within the limited capacity that we are having to address this. Hence, effective means, impactful means, rather than have that uh, consolidated approach, which is legislated and therefore holds these in, in institutions to uniformly address this issue. And uh, as I cited the example of budget on its own, if, if there is no budget in place, universities decides what uh, budget is there sufficient for them to address this, whereas we can we, we do not see impact in, in that regard. The, uh, 
there was a question relating to accountability to say that who then took this institutions to ensure that their employment opportunities and policies and activities are carefully. With all these investments are paid, it became clear that there is lack of compliance with employment to create that gap. Uh, in, in, in transformation. Therefore, the Department of the Labor in that regard, it's important for them to also play a role. Therefore, they are accountable as well as far as that is concerned. The Department of Higher Education and Training, through the recommendations that the Commission um, um, issued against them in, in ensuring that there is this consolidated approach in addressing gender transformation, it's clear that they are reluctant in addressing those. Um, recommendations. Uh, so they are also part, uh, in, in part, uh, accountable for this. And um, now, in respect of the, the employment um, equity uh, in the workplace, you, you would have noted also the current employment equity legislation, which speaks to transformation or employment equity. Let's, um, in as far as its enforceability is concerned, you, the country has been struggling with how do you get the best quota system for what um, sectorial determination targets can be put in place so that we can say next year you are forced or compelled as an institution to appoint a particular person to address lack of transformation. And I believe now this level of movement in this area, whereby we take those steps to ensure that um, implementation and enforcement is done. Many um, stakeholders that are, should be taking part in this role, therefore, are lacking in, in, in carrying their individual roles. And uh, one of the reasons the Commission also um, resolve to take this step of engaging the president so that it addresses this from a legislative point of view. Is the limitation as a result of the recent judgment that we are having in the data that have the, the constitutional court regarding the binding recommendations of the uh, chapter nine institutions, particularly the Human Rights Commission. That matter is still continuing. And, um, and in as far as the, so until the constitutional court also uh, addresses that aspect and clears the roles of these chapter nine institutions and clearly define their binding nature of their recommendations. It will assist at the current moment. It is one of the limitations uh, regarding the binding nature of the recommendations of the city. And part of this uh, engagement is then to obtain your input in, in this regard so that we can take these issues and ensure that there is implementation. I believe that a uniform approach, it will be a good start to say that there is a specified for minimum budget is required. There are minimum. That is an address aspect. And to cover also the questions regarding the selective national technologies, which we decided to include in our programs for transformation hearings. We are guided also by our strategic and our also annual performance plan, as well as the limitation that the current federal commission is, is having offices in all the provinces. And we have staff complement of five um, officials in the provinces. So we have to manage what we have. Hence, we look at this engagement as part of those engagement to, to, to show impact. Instead of taking the approach that we must then go to each and every college or each and every university to try and give it, whereas we can see that we are just going backwards. So the approach is that let us go the um, legislative way, consolidated way, so that we. The other categories are not important, but we do acknowledge that uh, within our capacity, we will ever try to manage what we can. But if we do it then wiser at a high level, and from, uh, for an example, parliament or president's point of view, it then can take us uh, further. Uh, 
and defend In, in respect of there was a question also that was asked to say, can is the CGE willing to then expand also its scope of research? I believe that also speaks to education and also the um, functions of the legal department. Um, again, we in every financial year we look into our capacity in addressing all these issues. Yes, these are our wish to be each and every institution or organization to address issues. Uh, however, our capacity limits us. Um, your input is forever welcome. Um, in as far as, let us speak to also these stakeholders <coughs> to utilize our stakeholders because they are already at the ground level point. Our um, annual performance plans requires us through provinces to engage this, to have this stakeholder engagement and capacity. Um, the gender for contestants or activists in, in, in the ground in trying to um, expand our reach um, of CGE of ensuring that there is education and understanding and accountability that is being held. So we we do welcome that that uh, input that must uh, rather than expand it further and ensure that we bring our stakeholders closer. And these steps was one of those steps. And through this engagement, it's clear that we, we need to continuously take you in, in, in our engagements uh, in, in, in ensuring that you understand our mandate and assist us in as far as bringing to our attention some of these lack of um, transformation or violations that are taking place at the institutions. And there was then, uh, I think I addressed the issue, the question from Dr. Schultz regarding the policy and the, the, the law, and having uh, made the statement that uh, are we moving because GBVF has been there and there are unique um, issues that are continuing to emerge. Uh, yes, uh, in addressing the uh, challenges of institutions of higher learning. There is that then that need, which I think I spoke to regarding the development of the legislation that can um, require these institutions to simply um, follow this transformation prescript and address transformation issues. So I think I would allow some of my colleagues then to take some of the questions where I could have. Okay. Any comments in the question? It seems like there aren't any further comments online nor in the boardroom. Um, if, that is, if, if that is so, we'll then, we're reaching the finality of the webinar. But before that, I'd like to hand over to Mr. Bradley Sonnenberg to address the way forward, followed by, um, follow the, who will be following Mr. Bradley Sonnenberg thereafter would be Mr. Rabu Lalitzimo in respect of the closure of the webinar. I'll then hand over to Mr. Sonnenberg. Thank you for me. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so let me first say thank you to everybody who's joined us online. It's always you know, good for us to hear um, your opinions and get your perspectives and your observations on these issues. Um, we will, we've, we've listened to and we've noted um, what you had to say, um, and we'll consider and incorporate a lot of that, um, of that feedback into our reports. Um, I think the, one of the big issues that has come out today is the exclusion of the LGBTQIA community from policies, and that is something that I can say from the legal department is, is very much on our radar, not just in the uh, higher education sector, it's also an issue that we are picking up in other sectors as well. Um, there's also the issue of accountability, um, which we take note of, and I've, no I've noted Liesl's uh, points about budget allocation as well. So what's going to happen from here is the CGE and its legal department will engage sometime between now and the end of the year, uh, the President and all the Minister of Higher Education, uh, on our report, on the legal report, uh, and in an attempt to deal with this at the macro level, rather than the micro level that we have been looking at up to now. 
And then our report on that will be finalised um, towards the end of Q4 in March next year. Which then we will submit that report to Parliament and we will release it to the public as well on our website and possibly through a uh, media launch as well. Um, so that's the way forward from here. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you very much, Mr. Sonapu, for um, enlightening everyone with the way forward. I'll now hand over to Mr. Ralithimo to do the closure for us. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon uh, to our online participants from various sectors of our society, especially institutions of higher learning. Uh, good afternoon to Commissioner Subrayan Naidu, uh, Commissioner Dr. Colette Naidu, Commissioner Advocate Umede. Uh, thank you, Commissioners, for your you know, continuous strategic guidance to the Secretariat you know, in implementing our, as we implement our APP. Uh, good afternoon, uh, CEO, uh, Dr. Denis Matabroka, and uh, former Chairperson Dr. Mfano Zaylo Shosi. Uh, for your continuous support of the work of the Commission. Um, also, good afternoon to the HODs in the boardroom, uh, managers and colleagues at large. Uh, thank you for the indulgence with the questions and the robust discussions that ensued. I'd also like to acknowledge the offer from Otasi Sulu University. In fact, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you know colleagues from the Otasi Sul University uh, as you will be uh, participating in an upcoming conference uh, with regard to actually themed uh, from policy to practice, enhancing accountability, individual response, and gender transformation at the institutions of higher learning. So this is a conference that is organized by institutions of higher learning. Uh, in the Eastern Cape, led by the University of Port Head. So as the Commission, we are actually honoured to be partners, you know, in uh, uh, hosting that uh, upcoming conference. So this is part of our, you know, demonstration of commitments as the Commission, as far as working with uh, institutions of higher learning is concerned. So the conference will be on the 3rd, from the 3rd to the 5th of December. So colleagues, I'm just making in this important information to your session. Uh, colleagues, I don't want to repeat what both uh, participants and colleagues indicated as far as, uh, you know, the work of today is concerned. However, I want to emphasize that the mandate of the commission is very clear on holding both public and private sector accountable. And we cannot compromise on that. So there's no excuse uh, for, 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 for lack of accountability. You know, uh, lack of accountability has actually corroded public uh, respect for the rule of law and creation of un unconducive learning environment for students and other stakeholders within institutions of higher learning. The Commission for Gender Equality will continue to hold accountable all parties involved accompanied by progressive and innovative approaches to change the mindset of communities with regard to respect and advocating for gender equality, appreciating diversity and not leaving anyone behind. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, and when I say colleagues, I also mean all the, uh, the participants, even outside the CGE online, to say thank you very much for your uh, 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 participation in today's session. Thank you very much. That officially concludes our session. Good afternoon and go well, everyone. Thank you. Hope we'll get to the slides. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Bosch.